can start recording. Okay, so Shabbat Shalom. Uh, Joe's is the only one here in the, uh, what is this, the live audience. So Shabbat Shalom to all of you out in webland who are watching this video. Um, today is the 22nd, 21st, 22nd of Nisan. It is the end of Passover. Today is the last day of Pesach. Uh, starting tonight, we can eat bread again. Um, I did not teach last week, and Lynn had surgery this week, so she's not up to par. So you got just me, sorry. Um, and uh, basically, we'll be, um, there's no Torah, actual Torah portion for this particular week in the calendar cycle because we're the the portion that they read today has to do with uh, the Passover the last days of Passover the last day of Passover and going on into um, the Haftor is talking about the Messianic Kingdom so I will be of course covering those later on if I haven't already covered them, uh, memory does not serve well as to whether I've covered them or not. But if I haven't covered them, I will be covering them later on. If I have covered them, I will, I've, they're on the web, so you can find them. And finally, uh, semi-good news, I guess, um, I'm finding that I can download the videos off of Ustream and post them to YouTube. So as I go through, because I only have a limited amount of storage space on Ustream, I'm downloading all my videos on YouTube, so if you want to check me out, jdowell6 will get you to the teachings, um, and then you can go through the different teachings. They're all listed by the Torah portion. Um, I will be updating, uh, updating the titles and such so that um, they you'll be able to look for them under the Torah portion if you're specifically looking for a specific Torah portion or part of a Torah portion. Um, what else? Um, new Moon is next week. Uh, I was just looking on the calendar and it's not next, it's the Monday or Tuesday after next Saturday. So next week we'll be announcing the New Moon. Um, and I guess that's about it. Today we'll be talking about the, start talking about the gifts um, from Ephesians chapter 4. And I'll, I'll give a brief outline. Um, and then get into the teaching. So let's go ahead and get started with some prayer. Father, I thank you for today. I thank you for passing over us, Father. I thank you for the, the blood of Yeshua that is put on the doorposts of our hearts and allows you to pass over us and not bring us to certain death, Father, but to everlasting life and salvation. I thank you for the picture the Jews did 3,500 years ago, and I thank you that you will do the same picture in the day of the Lord. And those that are saved by your name will make it into the kingdom as resurrected bodies of which your son was the first fruits. In Yeshua's name, amen. All right, so, uh, counting the Omer. Um, let's go ahead and let me pull this up here real quick. So, Counting the Omer, um, we're going to start with the evangelists. Uh, if we go to Ephesians sh chapter 4, I'm going to, oops, throw paper all over the place, um, literally. So if we go to Ephesians chapter 4, this is the basis for this teaching, um, starting with uh, verse 7. Excuse me for just a second, clean up my... There we go. Uh, but to each one of us grace was given according to the measure of Messiah's gifts. Therefore it says, when he ascended on high, he led captive a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. Now this expression, he ascended, what does it mean except that he also had descended into the lower parts of the earth? 
He who descended is himself also he who ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. And he gave some as apostles, some as prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers, for the equipping of the holy ones, for the work of service, to the building up of the body of Messiah, until we all attain to the unity of faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Messiah. Okay, so... Um, Let me change teachings real quick. Um, escape. Uh, file. Open. Where am I? Time machine. Time capsule. Yes, I think out loud a lot. Jewish teachings. Web. Especially if I got a long way to go to get there. Uh, Where did we go? Bickering. There we go. Okay. And it's the same file system. So, uh, let me make sure. This is the last. Oh, cool. Okay. All right. So, Bickering. This is um, Bickering First Fruits. This is a very quick teaching. I'm gonna I'm gonna try to fly through it. I I talked with Joe about it. It is online, but it. Since I haven't talked about it in a week, and I, I want to kind of get this intro down, um, I'm going to just fly through this real quick. Okay, so, Bikarim, um is called First Fruits. Uh, Leviticus 23.9 says, um, we looked at it today in the um, synagogue. So 23.9 says, let me flip to it real fast, 25, 24. Uh, then the Lord spoke to Moshe, saying, Speak to the sons of Israel and say to them, When you enter the land which I am going to give you to reap its harvest, you sh then you shall bring in the sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest to the priests. And he shall wave the sheaf before the Lord for you to be accepted. On the day after the Shabbat, the priest shall wave it. Uh, now, on the day when you wave the sheaf, you shall offer a male lamb, one year old. Uh, it's grain offering, same day, uh, down to verse 15. You shall also count for yourselves from the day after the Shabbat, from the day when you brought in the sheaf of the wave offering, there shall be seven complete Shabbats. And you shall count 50 days, the day after the seventh Shabbat, then you, you shall present a new grain offering to the Lord. Okay, and that is Shavuot. That, it, that takes us to Shavuot. So, um, this is done, obviously, based on that passage. During It started on Hag Hamatzah. It's, now, here I get into an argument with the rabbis. It's according to what I read in the scriptures just now, it sounds like it shall always start on Saturday night or Sunday morning. Basically, Sunday. Um, and I built a quick little cal calendar, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Shabbat. The word used in this portion is Shabbat. It's not um, Shabbaton, which would be a special Sabbath, but Shabbat. Um, I, I'm going to skip through all this. Um, basically, that was just the things that had happened on where am I? Oh. Where am I? I lost the place. This doesn't have the same thing that Office does for its slideshow. Okay, so some of the things that happen on this day, this is the day that um, Israel passed through the Reed Sea or the Yam Suf, also known today as the Red Sea um, or the Gulf of Aqaba. Um, and we can see that in uh, Exodus 14 and 1 Corinthians 10. Messiah was resurrected. Uh, it says on the first day of the week. Big argument as to what day it actually occurs, whether it's the day after the special day of Hag Hamatzah, which is 
the second day or the first day of the week? Well, if you look at Messiah's death, he, we know he died on a Thursday. They prepared for, uh, we, well, we know he was in the ground three days. Because it says, as, no, as uh, Jonah, the Messiah will be in the ground three days and three nights and then rise again. Well, he rose Sunday morning. Master Minos. So if he rose Sunday morning, because it says on the first day of the week they came to um, prepare the body properly. So that's the first day of the week was Sunday. Count back three days. It's got to be at least Wednesday or Thursday night. Thursday night or Wednesday to be three days. So basically he had to have died on Thursday night. So that means Passover was Wednesday. Wednesday, Thursday, if it was the day after the Hag Hamatzah Shabbat, he would have resurrected on Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. If he had resurrected, because he had gone through the whole day of Passover during the trial and all the hoopla when they um, did all the conviction and said that he's worthy of death. The Passover lamb died on the afternoon of Thursday at 3 o'clock. So we know that it had to be Thursday the day he died. Then he's in the ground Friday, all day Friday, all day Saturday. Some argument as to whether partially Thursday or partially Sunday counted as a day, which, which way to count. But he was also in the ground Thursday night, Friday night, and Saturday night. So he couldn't have died on Friday. He had to have died at least on Thursday. And if by rabbinic tradition, first fruits was the day after the Passover, or the Hag Hamatzah, first day of Hag Hamatzah, it would have been, he would have resurrected on Shabbat. He didn't. He resurrected on the first day of the week. So that's how we know that rabbinic tradition is wrong in this case. Um, we, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to look at these um, verses. Uh, you can look them up on your own just for uh, sake of time. But we are the first fruits of the resurrection. Yeshua is the first fruit. Um, Vayakra or Leviticus 23, 15 through 16, we already read, talking about counting 50 days. Um, and this is a quick, quickie. Uh, if you move the, the day, any other day but Sunday, you don't have perfect weeks. You have half a week at the beginning and half a week at the end, and you can't have a perfect week. A perfect week is day one through Shabbat. God set that up in Genesis chapter 1. So just real quick on um, the 50 days, and this is what it would look like on the calendar. So now we get into Ephesians 4 that we just read. Um, starting on Bikarim, counting the 49 days, um, it took 49 days from, for Israel to, to leave the Reed Sea from Mitzrayim, which is when they actually left Egypt, to Mount Sinai in Saudi Arabia. Um, there's six steps to perfecting. Now we get into the, counting, the actual counting the Omer. Uh, in the Mishnah, Minakot 10.4, which is um, part of, I want to say part of um, order, the orders. Do I have Minakot? I do not have Minakot. Um, it talks about um, the process for perfecting the grain. First you cut down the stalks, then you thresh the grain, the, then you winnow the grain, parch the grain, it's crushed, and then you sift the, the flour until it forms a perfect omer. Let's see if I can do this without... Uh, figure out where I'm at. Okay. So, where am I at? The gifts of general look. Okay, so this is going to be a quick down and dirty of all five gifts. Um, the first gift... Come on, somewhere. Uh, 
maybe. Okay, the evangelist. Um, the word for evangelist is kara. The word vayikra, which I've mentioned a couple of times here, the uh, word Leviticus, is actually the root of Leviticus. Kara is the root of Leviticus, to call, and it literally means to call out. Uh, pa the pastor, um, this is from Ephesians chapter 4, is um, to be used as a rod, to remove the flesh as it were. Um, the primary word for the pastor is roi, which, mean, which is a shepherd. Um, the teacher, they are the separator of doctrine. More, yera, or Talm and Talmud all come from the same word, which means teacher in Hebrew. Um, the prophet, uh, there's a verse, I, I will, we'll look at it when we get to the prophet, that talks about the prophet being, having words of fire. Um, several different words, roe, ra'a, jose. Jose is actually um, the root word of the book of Revelation. It means to reveal. And then navi, um, all different forms of the word seer or prophet. Um, what um, separates them from all the other gifts is dreamers of dreams and seers of vision and we'll get in again we'll get into each of these more definitely as we go through the five gifts um, they and they usually act out weird pictures and then the apostle who is the sifter and you know obviously I missed one but we'll talk about it in a minute uh, Shaliach uh, which is from Shalach my personal favorite by the way um, means to be sent out or to send out or sent, a sent one. Um, they have authority, they set things in order, they proclaim the gospel and teach, and are involved in warfare. So that's that one, down and dirty. So, I managed to go through an hour-long teaching in 15 minutes. <coughs> so, we get rid of that one, and we'll pull this one up. And so now we'll get started on the counting, the actual... The, we'll look at the evangelist. The evangelist is the first one. It's not the first one mentioned in, in Ephesians chapter 4, but it is the first one we're going to look at because they're the ones that bring people in. Um, this is Minnehote 10.4. They reaped, they reaped it, they put it in the basket, they brought it into the temple court, then they parched it with fire. Um in order to fulfill the precept that it should be parched with fire. So Rav Meir, or says Rav Meir, but the sages say they first beat it with reeds or stems of plants that the grain should not be crushed. Then they put it into a pipe that was perforated so that the fire might take hold of all of it. They spread it out in the temple court so that the wind might blow over it. Then they put it into a grist mill and took out of it a tenth of an ephah of flour which was sifted through 13 sieves, what was left over was redeemed and might be eaten by anyone. And this is the process that was done for the county of the Omer. This was done every day for 50 days. They had a specific field that was set up to bring um, enough grain and they would tie it off, probably a bundle about this big around of, of wheat stock, they would tie it off with a string. The high priest would walk out the first day and say, is this the stock? Um, and they would go through a whole ceremony. They would cut it off at sunset on the, on the day of um, first fruits, take it up to the temple with great procession and go through this process. And then they would find, you know, they would come down to a, an omer or a, what is it? Uh, um, uh, blah, blah, blah. A tenth of an ephah, which is an omer. An omer is a tithe of an ephah. So they would take this bucket and it worked out to about a quart, a little over a quart, almost a liter of flour. And that's, then they would take a handful of that and offer it. The rest, the priests would eat. Um, so, 
we're looking at the evangelist today. Who is the evangelist? Well, according to Webster's Dictionary and according to um, Wiki, um, Wikipedia online, this is the definition of an evangelist. A person who seeks to convert others to the Christian faith, especially by public preaching. A layperson engaged in Christian missionary work, a zealous advocate of something. Uh, a, the writer of one of the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. Um, and it comes from an old French word, evangeliste, ecclesiastical Latin from a class, uh, Greek um, to evangelize, basically to evangelize. So that's the modern day meaning of an evangelist. But let's look at what scripture calls an evangelist. So who was an evangelist? In Judaism, to preach is kara, as I mentioned just a few minutes ago, about 14 and a half minutes ago. Um, to, reach, to preach is the word kara, number 7121 literally means to call out, to cry out, to proclaim, to preach. Um, it forms the root of the word, as soon as it gets done getting me dizzy, forms the root for vayachra, and he called. This is the first word of the book of Leviticus. This is how it starts. Vayachra Moshe, uh, Elohim el, um, et Moshe, and called God to Moshe. The rabbis, when we reach Leviticus chapter 1, will bring the young children in. They will take their finger, and they'll have the fathers do this. They'll take the fingers, dip it in honey, and on each word of the Torah portion, they'll dip it in and dip it on their tongues to show the children that the words of Torah are sweet and that they should be enjoyed. What does Viacrod chapter 1 talk about? You remember what Viacrod chapter 1 talks about? Um, not, offhand, no. not offhand? The burnt offering. The very first thing it talks about is the burnt offering. Then you have six more chapters of offerings, two weeks of offerings. That is preaching in Judaism. That's how God preaches with the sacrifices. So, Isaiah, Isaiah 43, a, vo a voice calls out, kol kare, um, is the, the same word, kara, uh, to call out. Um, and then, Nehemiah 6, 7, what does that say? I guess I should have reviewed this before I got to it. But, oh, turned almost right to it. Nehemiah 6, 7. And you have also appointed prophets to proclaim in Jerusalem concerning you. A king is in Judah. And now it will be reported to the king according to these reports. Come now, let us take counsel together. That word proclaim is kara. Uh, and in this, case, in this case, a prophet is assigned to preach because nobody else is preaching. The, the, messy, the Jewish preachers weren't preaching. And if they were, they were preaching the wrong thing. So God had prophets do it. Um, Isaiah 61. Part of my favorite area of Isaiah. Uh, verse 1. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the afflicted. He has sent me to, the blind, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim to Karah, liberty to captives, and freedom to prisoners. And this is specifically talking about the Messiah. Um, Jonah 3.2. Good old Jonah. He is an interesting person. The only prophet to run away from God and get away with it, I think. Well, one of the few. Um, I always lose Jonah in my Bible. He keeps running away. There he is. Um, three, two. 
Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and Kara to it, the proclamation which I am going to tell you. So, scripturally, the prophets did most of the evangelizing. Mostly because the evangelists didn't do what they were supposed to be doing. It, so it was left up to the prophets, because the prophets are like, if they didn't, you know, most of the other gifts, they could turn off God's voice and say, blah, 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 blah. but when God talks to a prophet, he talks in vision. So they're walking along and they see something. No, I don't want to. No, I don't want to do that. Okay, okay, finally, you know, because God keeps hitting them with vision. And it's hard to shut your eyes if you are seeing stuff with your eyes closed or eye open. So, uh, let's see, Matthew 25, 15. These are all examples of evangelistic um, things. Matthew 23, 15. Uh, words of Yeshua. They're in red, so they must be important, right? Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you travel about on sea and land to make one proselyte, and when he becomes one, you make him twice as much a son of, of hell as yourselves. Now, why do I have this in here? Um, according to the definition we read, who was it that evangelized? The no, the Christians. It was, um, let me pull it up here. It says, evangelists, number one. A person who seeks to convert others to the Christian faith. Number one, def well, Yeshua here is talking to the Phar scribes and Pharisees about them converting people to Judaism. Long before there were Christian evangelists, so the Jews evangelized too. They don't anymore. They used to. When it became very unpopular and very dangerous to be Jewish, they turned the picture around so that now we have to go to them. Now, there are some scriptures to back that out, up, where the Gentile comes to the Jew to learn and not the other way around. Um, in the Torah, it says, but for your part, do not go to them they must come to you, talking about the stranger and, and becoming, you know, learning Judaism. But in this, Yeshua says, you're going out and proselytizing them, you're going out and evangelizing, and then making them twice the sons of hell. Well, you know what? That's happening in the church today. The evangelists are going out and evangelizing in the church, and I, you know, I don't pull punches. I'm not a non-profit. I am not seeking profit of any kind. I'm doing this to make the, the body of Messiah a perfect omer, like it says in, in Scripture, to do. So if I offend you, um, unless I'm wrong, I'm not sorry. Because another word for kara, and I think we're going to get to it here shortly, is an offense. If I can, oh, I guess I got to have that in there. There we go. Maybe. Okay. Um, come on. I had it working. Where'd it go? There it is. Uh, dee, 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 dee. There we go. So, the Tanakh. The Bible itself, and all these verses talk about the scriptures being an evangelist. Um, let's go to Isaiah 8. If I can find, there it is. So Isaiah 8, verse 2 talks about, And I will make to myself faithful witness for testimony. Uriah the priest and Zechariah the son of... Why do I have that? Um, I 
I don't know why I have that in there. I'm going to remember to pull that out. Uh, Exodus 25. Should be talking about my word being uh, 25, 16... And, oh, and you shall put into the ark the testimony, which is the witness, which I shall give to you. That testifies to people as to what's right. Um, and ch ver chapter 38 speaks of the same thing. 38.21 talks about the um, tablets of the testimony. 38.21... This is the number of the things for the tabernacle, the tabernacle of the testimony, as they were numbered. So all the things in the tabernacle give witness, their testimony of um, God. Hebrews chapter 3, the other side of the book. Uh, in fact, I just read this in my readings this week. Uh, verse 5. Now Moses was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which were to be spoken later. And then chapter 11, verse 14. For those who say such things make it clear that they are seeking a country of the... Oh, I'm sorry, verse 4, not 14. Um, by faith, Avel, or Abel, offered to God a better sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained the testimony that he was righteous, or the witness. God testifying about his gifts, and through faith, through though he is dead, he still speaks. By faith, Enoch was taken up, so that he should not see death. Um, and this is all about faith, but it's all testimony about the Torah and how the Tanakh evangelizes. Um, and here we go. As I just mentioned, if I offend you in any way, shape, or form, you need to email me or send me a message, and, and you can even do it in public. I, I'm not ashamed of what I teach. If I'm wrong, I will correct myself. But evangelism should be Offensive, and here's your proof. Isaiah 8. Let's see, was that the same? Oh, okay. I think that's the same. Let's make sure I'm in the right place. 8. Uh, oh, I know why. I was in the wrong chapter. Isaiah 8 2, going back to the Tanakh. No. Oh, the word testimony is what I was looking at. And I will make, I will take to myself faithful witness, witnesses for testimony. Uriah the priest and Zechariah the son of Yevarechiah. So I approached the prophetess, and she conceived and gave birth to a son. And this is Isaiah talking. And we go down to verse 14. Then he shall become a sanctuary, but to both the houses of Israel a stone to strike a rock and a rock to stumble over, a snare and a trap for the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And many will stumble over them. And this is all talking about the word of the Lord. Um, for thus the Lord, uh, back to verse 11. For thus the Lord spoke to me with mighty power and instructed me not to walk in the way of the people, saying, You are not to say, it is a conspiracy in regard to all that the people call a conspiracy, and you are not to fear what they fear or be in dread of it. It is the Lord of hosts whom you should regard as holy, and he shall be your fear, and he shall be your dread. Then he shall become a sanctuary, both to the, to, but to both houses of Israel, a stone to strike and a rock to strum, stumble over. So this is talking about the word of the Lord. So, and God himself. Jeremiah 23. Uh, D B D D B D twenty three twenty nine. Next page. Uh, verse 
It is not my word like fire, declares the Lord, and like a hammer which shatters a rock. So, uh, you know, something offensive. And then we get to Matthew chapter 11. Oop, turned right to it, almost. Missed it by a page. Um, verse 6. Um, uh, start from verse 4. And Yeshua answered and said to them, uh, let's see. Uh, let's start from verse 1. And it came about when Yeshua had finished giving instructions to his 12 disciples, his shlachim, he departed from there to teach and to kara in their cities. Now when Yochanan in prison heard of the works of Messiah, he sent by his, by his Talmudim, or his shlachim, and said to him, are you the expected one, or shall we look for someone else? Well, he's already prophesied to the people when Yeshua was baptized. He knew who he was. So he was probably trying to get his um, Talmudim to follow after Yeshua. Or shall we look for someone else? And Yeshua answered and said to them, Go and report to, y to Yochanan what you hear and see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he who keeps from stumbling over me. Well, if he was such a, a great and, and, and positive thing, why would people stumble over him? Because he was teaching the truth. And, and it's um, offensive to people. Uh, chapter 13, verse 57. I think this is one of my more favorite Yeshua quotes. Um, yeah, no, this isn't it. Uh, oh, so let's back up to verse 53. And it came about that when Yeshua had finished these parables, he departed from there. And coming to his hometown, he began teaching them in their synagogue, so that they became astonished and said, Where did this man get this wisdom and these miraculous powers? Isn't this the carpenter's son? Isn't his mom called Miriam? And his brothers, Yaakov and Yosef and Simeon and Yehuda, and his sisters, are they not all here with us? Where did he get all this learning from? And they took offense at him. But Yeshua said that to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and in his own household. And he did not do many miracles there because of their unbelief. Um, now, I don't have it, but Yeshua also called himself a, a stumbling block. Uh, let's go, let's see, what do I have? First Peter, I think he's quoting it here, 2, 8, ah, yes. So, uh, First Peter 2, um, verse 4, And coming to him as a living stone, rejected by men, but choice and precious in the sight of God, you also as living stones are being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Yeshua the Messiah. For this is contained in Scripture. Behold, I lay in Zion a choice stone, a precious corner, and he who believes in him shall not be disappointed. This precious value, then, is for you who believe. But for those who disbelieve, the stone which the builders rejected, they became, this became the very cornerstone and a stone of stumbling, and a rock of offense. And the Greek word is, offend, is the verb to offend. For they stumble because they, are dis, they do not listen to the word, and to this they were also appointed. So, and, let's see, verse 8, uh, no, it doesn't have it. Um, oh, verse 7. Uh, did I have that up there, Matthew? No, I didn't. Matthew, let's back up here, see what this is. 21. Uh, where'd it go? Uh, oh, 42. Um,
Matthew 21, 42. Then Yeshua said to them, Did you never read the scriptures, the stone which the builders rejected? This became the chief corner. Thus, this came about from the Lord, and it is marvelous in our, own, in our eyes. Therefore I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and be given to a nation producing the fruit of it. And he who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, but on him, whomever it falls, it will scatter him like dust. And when the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parables, they understood that he was speaking about them. And when they sought to seize him, they feared the multitudes because they held him a prophet. So, um, Yeshua was offending everybody. Not because his words weren't correct, but because they were correct. They were the truth. And if you, basically, if you tell the truth and you offend somebody, mm, you know, there's a nice way to put it, but, you know, you're, if... If somebody doesn't want to look at what they're doing wrong and you tell them the truth, it doesn't matter how you're going to put it, they're going to get offended. If they don't want to look at it. If, they, if they're willing to look at it, no, good things happen. So an evangelist, so now let's get more specifically into the evangelist itself. An evangelist's desire is to bring people in. Um, I'm not going to go to these uh, verses for time's sake. We're almost out of time here. But Philip and Timothy were first century evangelists. It calls them evangelists in the scripture. Um, Acts 8 and 11 both talk about um, Philip and Timothy. Uh, one's Philip and the other's Timothy, I believe. And the, one does the eunuch from Ethiopia or somewhere like that. And he meets and he is transported to this guy. 75 miles away in an instant and he shows up and there's some water there and the guy he starts explaining the scriptures a guy goes well how am i going to be saved and he says you know be baptized in both the water and the spirit so there's a pool of water and they get baptized. he gets baptized and they go on and he goes on studying scripture the other one is talking about a city full of people that um uh, i believe it's timothy is evangelizing the letter to Timothy calls him an evangelist. It's written by, I believe, Paul, Rabbi Shaul. Um, Tim Oteo, almost there. What did I say? It's 2 Timothy 4 5. Um, yeah, Shaul, an apostle of the Messiah in chapter 1. By the will of God, according to the promise of life, to Timothy, my beloved son. Um, chapter 4, verse 5. But you, be sober in all things, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. So he's saying, you are an evangelist. You know, you got to do your thing. Um, even the church today is full of evangelists, but very, very few use Judaism to teach. They use the New Testament to teach. Um, greatest evangelist of our day is Billy Graham. He truly is an evangelist. He, he got people saved right and left. But he never, ever taught the Old Testament. So, where is he going to end up in heaven? Don't, or in the kingdom? Don't know. Not my problem. But he was an evangelist and he used his gift. Um, the the TV is full of evangelists. Some are actually evangelists. Some are pretending to be evangelists. Usually the ones that do the best job and have the biggest churches are the best evangelists. So, let's look at some of the traits of the evangelists. Um, now, this is not biblical. So, this is based on observations, but also some, some scriptural evidence of, of what they can do. Um, but it's not scriptural. So, you know, you can quote me on it, but I'm saying right now it's not scriptural. It's just what we've seen evangelists able to do. Big thing about an evangelist, they can take a huge scriptural concept, um, like the messianic kingdom, and condense it into a little nugget. Make things easy for people to understand so they can get saved. 
Um, they are not very detail oriented. Um, I, you can ask my wife, I'm very detail oriented. Sometimes I get caught up in the details. Not necessarily a bad thing, but evangelists, forget it. No detail. <laughs> like I said, they take a big concept and shrink it down into a little nugget so that people can look at it and go, oh, that's cool. Okay, I can deal with that. And later on, they learn the, the big concept from other people. Um, it's said of evangelists, someone who can, it, there's someone who can get things done. Again, I go back to Billy Graham. He can get people, he could get people saved on a dime. You know, he had many, many evangelistic missions. They always went out and always got people saved. Had hundreds of thousands of people flocking to his church to get saved. Um, now, he's a sales, you know, uh, I knew a couple of evangelists and they were really good. Now I take that back. Um, most evangelists are good salesmen if they're doing it the right, if they're using their gift correctly. Um, they are great salesmen for God. Again, we go to Billy Graham, great salesman for God. Um, Jimmy Swaggart, I think, was another televangelist that got a lot of people saved. Um, whole whole flock of them, especially back in the 60s and 70s and 80s. Um, but they always run, run the risk of going from getting people saved and getting them into a ministry somewhere where they can learn and grow to just becoming a salesman for the, the almighty dollar. And, oh, that's it. So there's someone who can get things done. And, cool, I still got 10 minutes. Um, I could actually look at those verses in Acts. Let's go back to Acts for a second. Um, while we're here, let's see, back up. Look at Timothy and Philip. Acts 8, 2, 12. Because this tells us actually how an evangelist works. Acts 8. Verse 12. Um, uh, let's see. So uh, let's start from verse 9. Now there was a certain man named Simeon who formerly was practicing magic in the city and astonishing the people of Shomron, claiming to be someone great. And they all, from smallest to greatest, were giving attention to him, saying, This man is what is called the great power this man is what is called the great power of God and they were giving him attention because he had for a long time astonished them with his magic arts but when they believed Philip's preaching the good news about the kingdom of God in the name of Yeshua the Messiah they were being baptized men and women alike and even Shimon himself believed and after being baptized he continued on with Philip as he observed signs and great miracles taking place, he was constantly amazed. This guy's a magician. He, he uses sleight of hand to do his great and powerful works. S Philip was doing it by the power of God. Um, now when the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Shomron had received the word of God, they sent Kepha and Yochanan. Well, Philip's an apostle or somebody who could get people saved in the spirit, why do they need to send apostles? We'll get into apostles last. But um, they send two apostles up to get people born in the spirit. And they came down, prayed for them, and they, that they might receive the whole Ruach HaKodesh. For he had not yet fallen upon any of them. They had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Yeshua. Then they began laying their hands on them, and they were receiving the Ruach HaKodesh, 
And when Shimon saw that the spirit was bestowed through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money to, to get it. And they're like, yeah, right. So, Philip, they can take this great big concept and, you know, apparently they're getting people born again, but the spirit's not following, falling on them like they can with an apostle. So, um, Philip was a evangelist. Uh, Acts 11, three pages over, verse 20. Um, oh, that was actually Philip and... Was that Philip and... No, it was just Philip. Uh, verse 19. So those who were scattered because of the persecution that arose in connection with Stephen made their way to Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except Jew, to Jews alone. But there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who came to Antioch and began speaking to the Greeks also, preaching the Lord Yeshua. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a large number who believed turned to the Lord. And the news about them reached the ears of the congregation at Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas off to Antioch. Then, then when he had come to come and witness the grace of God, he rejoiced and began to encourage them all with resolute heart to remain true to the Lord. Now Barnabas was another apostle. We haven't looked at him too much, but he's another apostle. So again, these guys from Cyprus and Cyrene were evangelists. They went and evangelized, but they couldn't get the spirit on them. They needed something else. So God sent an apostle and he Got him birthed in the spirit. Um, and that's that one. Uh, now, there is another story in here. Um, Somewhere bigger. Okay, guess not. Um, don't remember where it was. I believe it was Philip. Maybe it's after. Um, oh, the next the chap back to chapter eight. The Ethiopian. Uh, and so when they had solemnly testified and spoken the word of the Lord, they started back to Jerusalem and were preaching the gospel, the good news to many villages of the Samaritans. But an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Arise and go south to the road that descends from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert road. I've actually been on, I can actually say I've been on that road. <laughs> um, maybe. Um, well, I've been to Jerusalem. Yay! Uh, and he arose and went, and behold, there was an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasures. He had come to Jerusalem to worship, and he was returning and sitting in this chariot and reading the prophet Isaiah. So he was re probably reading, Isaiah, let's see, does it say what he was reading? Um, Twenty-eight, uh, WD, WD. It doesn't say what verse in Isaiah he was reading, but he was probably reading something about the Messiah. Um, and the Spirit said to Philip, Go up and join this chariot. When Philip had run up, he heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and said, Do you understand what you're reading? He said, Well, how could I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now the passage of Scripture which he was reading was this. He was led to as a sheep, Isaiah 53. So, 32, yeah, Isaiah 53, verses 7 and 8. He was led to, as a sheep to slaughter, and as a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he does not open his mouth. In humiliation his judgment was taken away. Who shall relate his generation from his life? For his life is removed from the earth. And the eunuch answered Philip and said, Please tell me of whom does, this pro does the prophet say of this, of himself or of someone else? The Jews teach that that is about Israel, but it's about the Messiah. 
and we were just looking at that last week on Shabbat. So Philip took that great big huge concept, put, put it down into a little nugget for this Ethiopian to chew on. Um, and as they went along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, water, what prevents me from being baptized? And Philip said, If you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Yeshua the Messiah is the Son of God. And he ordered the chariot to stop. They both went down into the water, Philip as well as the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away, and the eunuch saw him no more. And, but he went on his way rejoicing. And Philip found himself at Azotus. And he passed through and kept preaching the gospel to all the cities until he came to Caesarea. I've been there. <laughs> I can say I've been there. Got pictures and everything. Um, so that's the evangelist in a nutshell. Let me cut that off. Um, Somebody who can take a big, huge concept, boil it down, and get people saved. They don't necessarily receive the Holy Spirit right at that moment, but they, um, and according to Scripture, people believed, but they weren't receiving the Holy Spirit until an apostle showed up. So, what we think are evangelists here today may actually be apostles working and teaching. I gotta do some more research on that, but it's it's a it's a um, definite possibility because um, the scriptures are clear that the apostle is the one that gets people saved, not the evangelist. They get the evangelists get people in, and as we go through the the next four weeks, we'll see each of the different gifts and how they work and get people into the kingdom and into um, a right standing with God. So, I smell food on the table. It smells delicious, dear. So, let's go ahead and finish this up, and we'll go from there. Father, I thank you for today. I thank you for the evangelists in the world. Though we don't always get along, Father, I know they're important, and I know their word is your word, if their heart is after you. Father, I ask that you bring evangelists, not just to here, but to all the congregations of the world, all the people that follow your will. Bring the evangelists to spread your word and bring people in, as is your desire for all men to be saved. And Father, I ask, I, I thank you for this time of the counting of the Omer. Um, I want to do that real quick before we finish. And Father, I thank you that you've given us this time to perfect the Omer of our lives for the next 50 days from last Sunday, Father. You've given us this time to perfect our lives. And Father, I thank you that you've given us the ability to follow your will and your word in Yeshua's name. Amen. And the last, very last thing. Uh, it's not quite sunset here in San Diego, but I'm going to go ahead and read the next day's service because we read it at sunset. Uh, Sovereign of the universe, as we count the days of the Omer, we recall the time when our people were established in the land of Israel. May this observance serve as another reminder of the need to reclaim the soil of the Holy Land so that it may again flow with milk and honey and provide a homeland for our scattered folk. May our love for Israel's land quicken our love for the Torah, Israel's heritage, as in the past may Eretz Israel become the center of our spiritual life, from which again shall come your word, O Lord, revealing your will to all men. I am about to fulfill the precept of the counting of the Omer, as it is written in the Torah, you shall count to you from the day after the day of rest, from the day that you brought an omer of grain as a wave offering, seven complete weeks they shall be, until the day at of the seventh week you shall number fifty days. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam asher kitshanu b'mitzvotav vitzivanu al sefirat ha-omer. 
היום שמני, שמניה, שמונ, שמונה ימים. שהם שב, שבוע אחד ויום אחד לעומר. Today is eight days, which is one week and one day of the Omer. Amen.